it's good to be back and good to see you. And um, I would like, uh, I need to, to request a request of you, and I'm sure you won't care, but with my, my new schedule, my teaching schedule, um, I need to move our, if we can move our class to 1015, I would not have to leave my kids at the end of the hour. Because <laughs> as it is right now, it, when last year it was okay because the next teacher, our rooms were open. She could just look at me. Now we have enclosed real classrooms. So somebody has to physically come in my room, and that just disrupts everything. So, and I don't have a class after the, so 10, I'll, I'll make it work as far as my, I'm rambling on and on. 10.15 start time, would that work for you? Oh, yeah. Same dismissal. But that just, it, it keeps me from having to have somebody cover me, which is, really isn't fair. And they've been very good to allow me to, to leave. And they didn't ask me to do that. I just, you know, wanted to do that. And um, because of the, the time we are getting ready to go into Labor Day and all the things, um, what I would also like to suggest, if it works for all of you, because still not everybody's back, which is fine, is if we will wrap up today, and then the first Thursday after Labor Day, we'll return back, and we'll pick up our Matthew study. Mm -hmm. Okay. The what if was a fill-in, but I think that will help all of us to get back into a groove, and maybe some of you will be gone. It will also, is a little bit selfish on my part, it helps me get into the groove of teaching I don't know if you knew this. I went from four hours today. I'm full time right now. Yeah. So they're they're trying to to get somebody to do my social studies classes, but I'm planning two classes I've never taught before, and so I'm getting a little overwhelmed. <laughs> but um, I I just want to help make the school, you know, go. And so they're looking, for, but that will help me give me kind of get into this new routine, because I've already said I'm not giving up Bible study. <laughs> But um, and I appreciate your prayers, and I know you do, you do pray. But that's the reason it's a little hectic right now. But, uh, and uh, well, I'm teaching. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Social studies is kind of fun, though. You know. <laughs> I said, oh gee, I don't want to give that up, but then I do want to give it up. <laughs> I just want to... Okay. Uh, let's ask the Lord to uh, calm our minds and um, to cause us to really focus on who He is and. And what he's done for us, I, I just had a great time with my kids as a preface to something that I'm teaching them. And helping them to refocus on who God is and what all he's done for us. And how important that absolute truth is that we're standing on. Because we're reading some books that present some strange ideas. But then we can say, why don't we believe this? And I love it. But we need to remember it too. Why do we believe what we believe? Because we stand on the absolute truth of God's word. So we thank you, Lord, that we do. We thank you that you're holy and righteous. We thank you that nothing escapes your knowledge, that it was already planned, and the outcome is already determined. And in your sovereign will, in your love for us, in your mercy and understanding, in your gracious provision through us, through Jesus Christ, your Son, we know it is well with our souls, it is well with our minds, it is well with us, because we rest totally and completely in you, in whose name we pray. Amen. I love having the opportunity in a Christian school to, as we read novels that are appropriate to read, to when I see expressions on my kid's face, said, well, that doesn't make sense. And I said, it doesn't? Why doesn't it? Well, because Jesus, or God, or the Bible said, I said, yes, don't ever lose that. And I have been very upfront with him in telling him the world is after you. This age, particularly my middle school kids, my, my sixth or eighth, Satan wants them. He wants them now. Because if he can get them now, if he can make them start questioning <laughs> the truths that we've been teaching them, he can sucker them in to some of the things that are going on in the world. And so I'm fortunate, and I thank God for the opportunity, to reinforce and no. We stand on truth, and it cannot change. Otherwise, it's not truth. Truth is only truth if it's a fact. And we know the facts that God has given us. So, you know, it's a great opportunity. And we have to pray for this generation. is so vulnerable. And, and you know all the things that's in the news, and every bit of it 
is an attack by Satan to get us as a people to take our eyes off truth and to think, maybe this could be true. Well, what's so bad about believing this? Well, those people deserve... To... We didn't make the decisions, <laughs> so we can't change them. And that's what we understand. But we need to live it out. And, and two, for us to be aware, these things that can be make you so despondent, and you think, how could this be happening? God is permitting it for his sovereign purpose, and his will is already accomplished. We're just going to see it play out on the world stage. What a blessing to be able to do it, even in the, quote, yucky stuff. I really didn't want to see this in my lifetime. Well, this is your lifetime. And God has already ordained it. Now, if we think about this, it goes back to what we were thinking about what's happening in Esther. Esther was brought into captivity. Okay, She did have had no control over her life. Fortunately, she had an uncle, Mordecai, who was looking after her and making provisions for her. But up to the point we left off with a story with her, what did Esther have control over? Her, only her response to it, right? Did she have control over her circumstances? No. But right on the money, she had her, res her, her response. Um, that's so great. Do we have control over the response we have to things? Can we change a lot of things that are going on in the world? By wishing it away, can we change COVID? By wishing it away, can we make our government not have total debt? Oh. So I can be miserable over it. Say, if only I could change it. I wish I could change it. Well, wishing isn't going to make any difference, is it? So how do I respond to it? And for us, as it was for Esther, even though we, until it's where we're at now, we don't know a whole lot, or we didn't know a whole lot about her religious upbringing. Now we see that she tends to understand some things and has been taught along the way. God's name isn't mentioned in this book. But who's completely in charge of this book? And everything that happened. God didn't have to tell us he's in charge because he is. It's like, I'm God, so you need to listen to me. I'm doing it. You don't have to listen to me anyway. Make up your own decisions. Okay? He's not forcing us, right? So I think we see a beautiful example in Esther of how God was ordaining all the pieces to fall into place because he was going to save a remnant through somebody who didn't totally get the big picture we have the completed word, so if we study it, we can get the big picture. God has given us everything we need to know to have a relationship with him, to have the security that we belong to him, to know how we then ought to live, to know what he has ordained for us to do, serve him and worship him, and to know that he's in charge of it all and it won't go wrong. What else do we need to know? That's a whole lot that God has chosen to give us through the word. So when we get, and people get so hung up on certain passages and certain books of the Bible that I, I, I don't know about that. And they just want to pitch those out. Well, just because they're difficult doesn't mean they deserve pitching out. But more importantly, we can't pitch out because they're God's. So God didn't have to mention his name at all. He's still in charge. The world doesn't have to admit that God's in charge. It doesn't change the picture, does it? Don't you love that? I mean, there's something refreshing about it in a sense. Oh, yeah, I got through this whole book, and it has nothing to do with you, God. Oh, it has everything to do with you, God. And it applies to me because I know you. You are my God. And so whatever upbringing Esther had in the temple, because she's Jewish, you know, that's the reason she's in this predicament right now. In fact, nobody even knows she's Jewish for the time being. But God put her there, and Esther has recognized that maybe, just maybe, I've been put here in this particular time because I'm the only one who could do the job. In your own life, you have been and you will be put in particular 
places because you're the only one who can do the job. And you may have no idea why you're there until God calls you to do something and you're looking around and said, oh, who am I pointing to? <laughs> no, <laughs> okay, it must be me. God sometimes works within his grace in recognizing that we may not be quite prepared for what he's asking us to do, but he still expects us to do it. Let's go back to Moses. Oh, we've got the wrong guy, God. It's not me you want. Now, my brother, he's pretty good at this. He can talk. But, you know, I'm tongue-tied. I, maybe he stammered. We, you know, whatever it was, it loomed large in the face of Moses. Not me. You know, it, just pick anybody else. So who led the people out of Egypt? Oh, <laughs> you know, the one God chose, right? Okay. But he gave him Aaron to help him along the way. Sometimes he will grant us that person to help us along the way, but he never takes away the responsibility that he called us to. Do you get the differentiation? Okay. Mordecai had Esther. Esther had Mordecai. Their relationship began to change in this situation, didn't it? All because God knew what the appropriate activities for each of them was going to be and what the king was going to do and what Naaman was going to plan. But God didn't midstream say, I think I got this backwards. And, and, listen, and you know that I'd like to do this because I think it's important for us, again, to really contemplate how specific God is about things. Suppose when Moses told God, which God already knew all about how Moses could operate, right? He understood Moses had a problem speaking. It, God didn't have to say, thank you, Moses, I didn't realize that. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes when we tell him, I'm sure he's saying, thank you, I didn't know that about you. Well, if he didn't know that about us, we'd really be foolish to follow him, wouldn't we? But because he does know that about us, we can trust him. But in Moses wavering, okay, God was willing to grant him grace by saying, Aaron will be a good person to walk alongside of you, but you're still the one responsible. I didn't take away your responsibility. If he calls us, ladies, we're responsible for what he called us to do and to get accomplished. And he may give us wonderful people along the way, but we're still the one that has to get it accomplished. We can't give that to somebody else and say, they'll be better at it, so now I don't have to worry. No, because you're still responsible. Now, can you put them in charge of a whole lot of things? Yes, and they may be, a, be dynamite and outshine you in a thousand ways. Be very grateful. Who still is given the first responsibility? You. So if they mess up, it's on you. We know that, don't we? We know that because it works in real life and everything. Okay. But how broad are the scope of the importance and the eternality of it when we realize this is what God does. So when... Everyone's taken to captivity. And remember Daniel and the three men thrown into the fiery furnace? That wasn't a surprise to God. Everybody knew that. They knew why. We're going to annihilate the Jews. Now, who wanted to annihilate the Jews? Every nation on earth. Who still wants to annihilate the Jews? Uh huh. And I just heard something to show you how, how deep it goes. Because God said this would happen. They want to get rid of my people, and then we're going to go back to the real reason. You know that Ben and Jerry's ice cream place? I, I hope you've already thrown them overboard with all their liberal views and stuff. They had just taken, as if anybody cared, but I guess it did, because it made a headline news, and George said, did you hear this? And I don't think it's, um, they are no longer going to let's see, have their products sold in the West Bank of Jerusalem. We're taking a stand. 
the West Bank, those evil Jewish people who defend themselves on the Gaza Strip, which has always been attacked from everybody, in that part of Jerusalem, you can't buy Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> oh my word, what am I going to do? Life falls apart. They think they have enough clout in the world to do something like that. It's a political move that will, could affect their business. Will it affect their business? Probably not at all. But what I want you to see is how large this notion is and has always been because Satan doesn't want the lineage of Christ to continue. He's been trying to get rid of Jesus forever, right? If you get rid of the Jews, there's no Jesus. So the Babylonians and every other nation is going to come up a way to do it. So Nahum's going to say, you know, we got to get rid of these nasty Jews because they worship differently. They serve a different God, and that could be kind of dangerous for us. Those days, the emperor, the king, whether they were the rightful king because they were in the bloodline or because they overthrew the bloodline king and now they're the king or the queen, you know, they ruled everything, didn't they? And they could make proclamations like they did in Daniel's day. Okay, you will bow down. Well, there were some jealous people in the kingdom. They didn't like the wisdom of Daniel and that the king kind of liked Daniel. So they set him up for fall, uh, a fall, right? You can go in the lion's den. And he came, oh, good, you, aren't, you, you didn't get eaten. Oh, I'm so glad. What well, was your silly rule? Well, I can't take my rule back. Remember, they can't undo their edicts. So if you get a king to sign a rule, you can't undo it. Okay. So Haman is going to get a law signed because he doesn't like Mordecai. Now, what's his problem with Mordecai? He's Jewish and... Outspoken, and when Nahum, who is an important person, like number two, comes to the gate, everybody is, oh, that's him. I don't have to even like him, but I do need to bow down. I do want to play the game. I'm going to play the game. <laughs> I'm playing the game. He didn't know I'm playing the game. Or because I'm not playing any game. I'm not bowing down to you. You're not my God. You're not my king. You were substitute for the king. I'm not going to. He would pay homage to the king. Okay. Our pride, the arrogance which caused our first fall and continues to cause us to fall, is seen exacerbated in Nahum's attempt to have Mordecai. Everybody else is doing what I want. He's not. So now this little nasty secret comes out. They're Jewish. They're Jewish. Hmm. But the problem is, who's already the queen? <laughs> Got out smarter than again, didn't he? <laughs> In our normal vernacular, we say that. But sometimes it helps us to look at that way. We think, as human beings, sometimes, because we're still in the flesh, and those who are not born again are still definitely in the flesh, we do think that we can outsmart lots of people in our daily life, perhaps with our taxes, perhaps with my time card at work, perhaps giving somebody else my job to do so I can leave early and not giving them... I mean, there's all kinds of ways we try to outsmart the people in charge, don't we? We try to cheat the government. We try to cheat... It is our nature as sinners to do all those things because we are incapable of doing one single righteous thing outside of Christ. So when we look at all those things, okay, I could be in that predicament if I were lost. Would I do certain things? Maybe not. Would we all do the same things? Maybe not. But we would all do some of those things and all of them based on our feeling that we're the most important person in the world. I told my students they had to write a paper on self because we had been doing some poetry. Because you're the most important person in the world to you. And I said, oh, no, that sounds too. I said, well, aren't you? And then we talked about how, how we have to admit we are. Who do you think about first when you get up in the morning? <laughs> Yourself, if you're honest. What do, and remember Trent did a little bit of this. 
What do I want for breakfast? What am I going? How am I choosing to react? I mean, it all centers. That is our nature in a lost world. As believers, Christ is changing our nature. So we can get up with thoughts towards others, how we can be a service, how I can please God. What do I need to ask him to do in my life before I even get moving? We can do that, but apart from him, obviously we can't. So in these situations, we see that Mordecai had saved the king's life because he overheard of a threat, right? And he had gotten that word to them. So now Mordecai has become an important person, and that's why um, <clears throat> the Jewish people are going to be gotten rid of. Because these Jewish people are causing a whole lot of trouble for um, Haman, who doesn't like being less than important. He really doesn't like being less than the king. You know, if you were in, let, let's say ladies, we're all ladies in waiting of the queen. Okay. And every day we got to go in and curtsy to her and do her bidding. How many of us would be really thrilled that we got to curtsy to the queen every day and say, what do you want, queen? Okay. Why do we do that? Because we're ladies and waiting. We have to. Do we have to do it without grumbling in front of the queen? If you want to keep your head. <laughs> okay. When we're on the way out and sh nobody can hear us, and say, do you really like her? Isn't she arrogant? I really don't like her. Well, yes, your majesty. We play the game. We play the game not because it's right, but because I want to protect myself. So who's first? Not the queen. Still not the queen. We can go through the motions. As Christians, we cannot go through the motions because God will see right through us. But when we've born again and had that experience Christ and he lives within our hearts and we go before the throne of God and we bow to the king of kings, how easy is that to do? You bought me. You own me. Yes, Lord, yes. Saying no to him is almost impossible. And it ought to get more and more difficult as we mature in our walk with him. But right now, the people in our story are still in very much their human nature, with the exception of what we are beginning to see that is spiritual in the lives of Mordecai and Esther without it being spelled out particularly. And what we also know, and there's several lessons. There's too many lessons in some of these. Have I ever told you? Sorry. I, I find myself repeating myself to my kids, and they look, I said, I know I told you that. Yes. <laughs> but I want you to remember it. Okay. But again, the big picture of God's picture. Okay, he knew they'd be in captivity. He knew there was going to be an edict that was going to try to kill all the Jewish people because they were just in the way of all the earthly kings. Mostly, they were in the way of Satan, and they, they've always been, right? Because that's where the Savior comes into play. So he uses the natural things that are happening. He puts Mordecai, who's sitting at the gate, he hears, and Mordecai, being an honest man and a man of integrity, goes and tells the right people that, I heard this, the king, and so now he's elevated, because even if you don't like the Jewish people, if somebody saved your life, you might want them kind of close to you because they're not holding any grudge against you. Oh, maybe like Christians wouldn't hold grudges against our enemy. So could the boss, we don't like, trust us if we're Christians? Mm -hmm. An unsaved boss, trust us when they give us responsibility? Because we are going to please not them. Who are we going to please? God. Over them. Now, it may please them and they benefit. That's not our problem. Unless it's immoral. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes it's, it's almost like we're playing the game, but we're not. Because we know who is directing our footsteps. And the bit of information we have about both Mordecai and 
<clears throat> Esther or that they had the training as Jewish people and that inheritance was theirs because God selected that nation. So they're important. That's the threat in the kingdom. That was the threat when Nebuchadnezzar had Daniel and the others, um, you know, thrown in lion's den and thrown in fire furnace because you've got to get rid of those people because they're going to mess everything up for me. Okay, so let's pick it up. In ver well, let's look over the notes first so we can see, and then we're going to pick it up um, at the end of the chapter. The, these will help you review what we had last week. Um, <clears throat> First of all, what are the human odds that Esther, a Jewish exile woman, would be able to replace Vasti, who fell out of favor with the king because she wouldn't do what he wanted to? And we all girls kind of laugh, so wouldn't we all want to say no? <laughs> what were the odds? Zero. Oh, uh, well, zero? <laughs> okay, that's the world's standard, right? Zero. Because we place odds on things, don't we? Okay? And when you place odds, you are gambling. Right? And when people, because this is so prominent today, when people buy those lottery tickets, okay, whether they spend a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever, they're taking a chance, okay, now that they can give you odds. Okay, They're taking a chance that they'll at least get their money back, maybe a little. It's a chance. There are odds placed with that. But in this case, because of the culture and because she was an exiled Jewish woman brought into the kingdom, not of her own will, that she would be replacing the beautiful queen. Who stood up to her husband? Okay. Was she the only choice? No. They had this parade of women <laughs> coming in. And remember how we said, hmm, that's spa, son. I think we might like all that and new dress and, you know. But what we don't like, and neither did they, deep within their hearts, they didn't like being an object to be paraded in front of the king and see if you look the best you're picked. Now, they had no choice because they were like a concubine. They own you. They can do whatever. Literally, they can do whatever they want to with you. And some were very kind to them. Some were not. The good news is if you had a lot of concubines, you might only have to see them one time in the, your whole time there. You probably got one night with them and said, I think I don't have to do this ever again. But, but those are realities. Those are things that we can think about because we're women. But so they're very much adorned. And then they're paraded in front of the people that are going to say, I want you, I want you, particularly the king. And he's probably going to say, maybe you know, others can help me. But he sees Esther. She stands out above all of them. Did she have any chance but to go before them? What if she said, I'm not going? That would not bode well for her, right? If you think life is tough now, what if you are totally exiled? All the concubines... The other women you're with in this harem are going to be kind of your buddies. And the only people you associate with, they're going to all hate you. If you suit up. Now they're going to hate her anyway. But, okay. but in our view of things, in the world's view of things, if we were going to lay odds on that, we would say, don't bet on that one because she's not going to be the pick. That's why the story is all that more marvelous. And it shows her humility. She was willing to do what she had to do because she didn't want to get Mordecai in more trouble. You can't stand up to the king and survive. One way or the other, life would be more miserable. So she does everything that she's supposed to do, and lo and behold, she's the one that's picked. So now we have zero odds that she will even appear before the king. Okay, and so now she appears before the king before all the other people. So what are we still thinking the odds are? They're still zero, aren't they? But not in God's book. They're 100% perfect that his choice will be the queen. How is that true in your own life? What are the odds that what God has planned for the rest of your life will happen? 
100%. It's never less than that, or he's not in charge. And as we always say, if he's not in charge, then we should not be here because we're pretty foolish. <laughs> okay. So when we look at it that way, we need to look at it because that helps us, again, understand the pure, total sovereignty of a God who is not playing games with people. He's accomplished his eternal will. I promised in the garden I will bring a Savior. Here's how I'm doing it. I don't care if you think it makes sense or not. I don't care if you like it. I don't even care if you don't like the part I have for you, but you're going to do it. Okay. If we've been called by him, right? But isn't that really a beautiful story of God's redeeming love? He is so tenaciously dedicated to having a people to love that he will make sure it happens. Girls, Esther became king so that we can be the daughters of the king. That's the reality. That's the purpose. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise his name, right? You did that for me? Mm -hmm. He did it for you. He did it for you. He did it for each of us individually so that we can become daughters of the king of kings. So on earth, an unlikely young lady became the queen in an unlikely enemy territory because God had a plan. And it could not, and he still be God, falter one iota from his purpose. That is our God. We need to live out that truth in our lives by our actions. I don't waver in that. He's proved it to us in Scripture several times, hasn't he? Okay, because I've been with all of you for such a long time, and I'm sure this is true of you. Okay, I know in your own personal life you've seen it played out, right? Has God always been faithful? Always. Even when those terrible things happened. Was God so faithful? Uh Uh-huh. Because, see, he can't not be. And because, and this is one of my worn-out repeat statements, but I like to remind myself about it, God is not doing that because he owes me his faithfulness. God is doing that because he's faithful to who he is. That's the biggie. That's why we can trust him. And that's also why I can never say he wasn't faithful to me, he wasn't fair to me. I'm taking away his attributes that I have no right to take away because I didn't give them to him in the first place. Now, that's a God on who uh, love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy we can stand, isn't it? Because we didn't have anything to do with any of this. Oh, my. <laughs> hmm. And I know some of you, because you shared with me, some of you have uh, experienced just like I, some times in our lives when we were made to feel so guilty that we even thought that maybe God really didn't love me anymore, that, that I couldn't possibly be one that he would choose and forgive. And that's all Satan's lie. He wants us to believe that lie. But there's no way we can believe it when we study what his word says. And that's where we get our truth. Compare the scripture with scripture. What did God say? Can you count on it? Yes. Good. Okay, now, if people take Scripture out of context, and be very wary of this, and I know I've warned you of this before, but modern-day <clears throat> preachers who want us to all feel good about ourselves and not mess with that nasty stuff called sin will take verses out of context to make us think that God is all-loving and all-kind, and that kind of God wouldn't ever send anybody to hell And guess what? That kind of God never has sent anybody to hell. Because he made a provision so we don't have to go to hell. But if we ignore the provision, um, if he changes the provision along the way, then can we trust him? (laughs) He might change it again. 
the inconsistency in the new theology defeats the whole purpose of it. Because you can't have it both ways like that. Okay? Why does God let certain things happen? We live in a fallen world. He already told us when the world falls, everybody's going to suffer. Creation suffers. Everybody suffers. God didn't make it. Fallen, he made it perfect. You see how the argument, oh, oh, God said, oh, oh, maybe God was right. No, God was right. Period. Okay, so um, go down through the, the second section. The lo loyalty of Mordecai and turning over those, you know, the gossip he heard. Haman's promotion because he is really getting angry with uh, Mordecai and he's running and telling on things to the king and making the king think that maybe Mordecai is not all that good example. Well, then Esther is brought into uh, the intervention because Mordecai calls her in and said, you know what they're going to do? They're going to kill all the Jews. Esther, you're one of them. <laughs> okay, now Esther's, what is she right now? A queen? Sorry, Katrina. i got to get back to my line. <laughs> Esther's been made the queen against all odds. Now Mordecai has heard and read this decree and now knows this is what's going to ha happen. All people of Jewish descent are going to be eliminated, annihilated, because Satan doesn't want them around, but neither does Haman because he's got a you know argument with Mordecai. So the king doesn't know what's behind all that. So, you know, Esther's gonna have to go tell the king. Do you know what this is gonna happen? Now, who doesn't know that Esther's Jewish? <laughs> Okay, now I've got to try to go in and see the king. And you just can't walk in and see the king. Even if you're married to the king. How would you like that? I have to be asked. <laughs> it shows you how set apart the king was from his subjects, including his wife. But it also shows the disparity of male and female in society throughout history. It is still in disparity, I would say, today, no matter how much we are changing it with certain laws. Some of them need to be made. Some of them are ridiculous, and we all know what ones they are. Because we believe, again, as Christians, that God did make a male, and he did make a female. Otherwise, there wouldn't be baby humans. <laughs> all right, But God also established a legitimate government within the household. The man's going to make the toughest decision, and the woman, you're going to have to follow, and you're going to make some other decisions about how you raise the families. But if we're all going to be the chief, nobody's going to get anything done. Because, no, I'm the chief. You're the chief. Well, you'll be the chief tomorrow. I'll be the chief tomorrow. Well, who's in charge today? Okay. God says, I am. So he's always been in charge, and the king is in charge. And we see how that, that works to not have chaos in any form of government. Okay. When everybody gets their own thing and their own will, it doesn't work. So the problem is, though, that the king is unaware that his wife is one that's going to have to be exiled. So all these messages are going out. Can you just imagine how Haman is saying, Ooh, mm, I got this covered. They're sending out these messages just in the local community where they are? No. And to yeah, everywhere. All the territory that they have taken over, and it's large. Remember how big it is? We talked about how much territory this covered. There's a whole lot of Jewish people that are going to get annihilated. A whole lot of Jewish babies got annihilated when Jesus was born, didn't they? And Rachel was weeping for her children. That verse was fulfilled from the Old Testament. Rachel is often weeping for her children, mean for the Jewish people that are being slaughtered in Holocaust, simple things like this in the early Holocaust. God has ordained it as a way of chastising his people who rejected his son, but they are still his people. They still have missions to fulfill. 
They will indeed be missionaries before the kingdom comes completely. And they are, yes, they are set apart. We don't have an argument with God who did that. Okay. We are grafted in deliberately because God never left us out. And he made a very strong point of grafting us in. So Now, you see how all this is related? And I know you understand, but this is really key to me and really digging deep in Scripture and understanding. We cannot possibly teach Esther as a nice little story in isolation from the prophecies. Because then when we get to the end, all we know, this is a little story, and Esther stood her ground, and so some Jews weren't killed. Oh, that's nice. That's not the end of the story, is it? God couldn't let all the Jews be wiped out. Look where Esther is in your Bible. Has Jesus been born yet? Oh, <laughs> that'd be problematic. They're all gone. God's going to have a dilemma. Well, let's see. I thought I'd use the Jews. Now they're all gone. Let's see. Who's another person I could use? Oh. So, as insignificant for some people, this book is because God's name isn't spoken in it. God's handwriting is all over it, isn't it? And it is with us. It is with us when it doesn't seem so obvious because we belong to him. He's protecting us. We're his heritage. He will always protect his heritage. He has always protected his remnant wherever they were. And he has always known who his remnant was. He doesn't have to look around and say, I wonder if they're part of the remnant. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Does he have to look around this small group of believers right here? When we are all in a huge coliseum and look around and say, where are my children? Hmm. No. Does he know you? He knows you by name. I don't care how many there are of us. Because he called us by name. We weren't part of a group. The Jews are being saved as part of a nation to fulfill God's purpose. Individual Jews have been called throughout the ages, like Isaiah, for instance. And God called him and told him what he wanted to do. And it was not fun stuff he wanted me to do. Bring all this judgment. I'm going to do this. I'm going to wipe them all out. And he called Isaiah by name. Out of all the Jewish people he could call, just as he did Daniel, just as he did Ezekiel and all the others, he called them by name. He used them for a purpose, and the purpose for all of them, and then particularly when you see what God did in the life of Isaiah, it was one I wanted to do. We get through it. Okay. When he got through hearing all the bad things he had to tell, um, he said, here am I, send me. This is not going to be fun. Did God call Isaiah by name for a specific purpose? He called Esther by name for a specific purpose. But equally important is that he has called us by name. By name for a purpose. And it is the same purpose it was for Esther to ultimately cause his name to be glorified. We should want to jump up and down and shout hallelujah or do lots of things that are not in our comfort zone because we're Presbyterians <laughs> um, and, or we were Southern Baptists when you didn't do those things either. Uh, or something. I mean, now, I'm not expecting you to do it, but you're welcome to do it. But I mean, doesn't that make you just bubble up in, inside with excitement? That's how precious you are to God. You are such a treasure to him that he not only went to the great pain for himself of sending his son to the cross, he called you by name and he reminded us that many are called but few are chosen. So we're special, special, special. And we don't have to understand how that all works. I've asked you before and I know you understand it. How many of you absolutely certainly 
beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've been called by God by name and you're his. How, do you, how many of you understand how that all happened? How many of you know it's for real? How many of you know nothing can separate you from him? What else do we need to know to go out and serve him? The reality. But these stories help us to get that bigger picture, doesn't it? And though we see how a young woman is willing to, for the sake of her people, take a risk. Nothing that isn't worth taking a risk for is really worth doing because it doesn't cost us anything. And if we don't have buy-in, it's not very important to us. Well, I put a lot of time and effort into that. Something better happen. Yeah, that's the attitude we ought to have, you know. Now, will it all come out the way we want? No, not, not necessarily. Sometimes, you know, not very likely. Okay, so let's pick it up. Um, Esther's intervention, Mordecai's recognition because of who he is. He saved the king's life. Uh, Naaman's fall, he's not real happy with the fall, is he? So let's look in chapter um, 7 of, of um, the book of Esther, who's Strange predicaments saved a nation and a remnant. When they were yet talking with the king, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Naaman to the feast that Esther had <laughs> made. He invited Haman to the feast. What does Haman think is going to happen? <laughs> Promoted. Ah, I'm a hot shot. <laughs> There's a verse called Pride Goeth Before a Fall. And the prouder we are, the bigger the fall, isn't it? Isn't that true? Because when the thing that you are proud about in your life is taken away from you, there's nothing left, is there? And you're looking all around, you're standing basically naked. I thought I had this. I thought I'd figured this all out. And we see it in prominent people sometimes, um, both in government and sports. And some of the people that make this, sometimes when they, they really fall hard, because the thing that they counted on to make them successful, or their identity is gone. And if my identity is gone, I have. We can't lose our identity. It was given to us by Christ, so we always have it. And our behavior doesn't change that. Now we get a, may get a spanking once in a while, but so the king and Haman went to the feast with Queen Esther, and on the second day. As they were drinking wine about the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, King Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be fulfilled. These kings and their hormones with these women are always offering their kingdoms. Remember Herodias danced for uh, King Herod? And uh, he was so pleased, I'll give you half of my kingdom. Oh, forget half of the kingdom, I want John's head. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. And can they take the word back? No. Now, that was the rule and the understanding in monarchies and even dictatorships. The king's edict could not be undone. Even if the king wanted to. When Daniel was spared in the diet, the king wanted to get rid of what he'd already said, but he couldn't because he would lose all his authority, wouldn't he? How... Much more important is the fact that God's edicts, God's words, cannot be changed. Right? Not only by man, we try to... God can't even change him because we wouldn't be God. That's the one thing people say, well, can God do everything? Well, no, he can't be anything less than who he is. <laughs> but the king, they were always had their pride at stake, so they could never renege. They might regret it, they might try to get around it, but I think, oh, shoot, now nobody will ever believe me. <laughs> and I won't have any power. Then the queen answered him, so now that you ask, king, what do I want? If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, buttering him up, right? you got to say the right things when you want something. Let my life be granted for my wish and my people for my request, for we, we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. For our affliction is not to be compared 
with the loss to the king. Notice how wise she is in her presentation of the problem to the king. Always keep it in mind, in an earthly sense, but we're going to stretch it too. In an earthly sense, if you're the person who can grant my wish, and I have found favor in your eye, okay, I want you to understand the reason behind my wish. If we have just been sold as to be slaves, I would not make this request because you would be losing too. You don't gain much in this because you'll be slaves and you won't have anybody, you know. So I'm not doing it because of that. What I'm doing it is because we're not going to be slaves. We're going to be annihilated. And she said about three ways. How can I get gone, dead? The king didn't know that. Now, she's presented it very wisely. Where did she get that wisdom, do you think? Who gives us wisdom? God. Well, who in the triune God gives us wisdom? The Holy Spirit. Did she go pray to the Holy Spirit before this? She prayed and fasted. Do we know if she was talking to the Holy Spirit? Is she talk? We don't know that, but we know she prayed and fasted. And she's opened herself up for some kind of wisdom beyond herself. When we realize, I don't have the wisdom, and that comes from God. Knowledge comes from something we can learn. Wisdom is only from God. And that's how to use the knowledge that we have wisely. So she was wise, and so she pursed her words just exactly as would get the king's attention without ruffling his feathers. And now she spells it out. Because of what's been written and you've approved, we're all going to die. We're not going to be slaves. It's worse than that. And I'm intervening because it means death for all of my people. She knows she has found favor with the king because he now has allowed her to speak boldly, which is not normally the case. Okay, so she's got some things in her favor because she has acted appropriately and with good character throughout. Right? She earned this right in human terms. And if she'd been sassy, if she'd been like King Vashti, saying, no, nah, I'm tired of you. Can't. No, she didn't do She did all the things she needed to do, being obedient to a husband slash king, Respecting his authority, whether she agreed with it or not, was beside the point. She respected his authority. Now she is in a position to do something she wouldn't have been otherwise. Does that tell us how important it is? Is it important for us to be in submission to our king, whether we understand the outcome or not? The minute that I am not in submission to my king... I am inadvertently saying what? I don't want to do what you told me to do. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to. What am I telling my king? You're not my king. <laughs> I'm not my king. That's not a good idea, is it? Within that statement, you're not my king, is always the implication that I don't trust you. If we go to our God, our Savior, our King, and intercede for ourselves or somebody, and we walk away thinking, I don't know if you heard my prayer. God tells us he does, right? Unless we have sin in our eyes, we haven't confessed, and then we better get right with him. Okay. Well, I don't really know if you'll answer it. Or I don't know if you do that kind of thing for your people. Or that may really be too big. Maybe I shouldn't ask that. All those things are kind of innocently questioning. Do we believe he's king? Do we believe he's all-powerful? Do we believe he does what he says? Here's an answer to our prayer. Not for our silly whims, but according to his purpose so that he's honored and glorified. Once we get a hold of that, praying becomes a whole lot easier. There's some things but we're not going to pray about because we don't need praying. I don't need to pray. Somebody, well, Terry and I have been through this with a couple of the girls in the jail um, who were so in love with somebody. And, was, and I'm praying about this. And I said, let's don't pray about it. Let's go to Scripture. What does God say? Okay, there's your answer. But if I prayed it. I said, what do you know? It's not his will. You're not going to change his will by praying. That it's, 
You're praying God to change his will. If we pray that God changes his will in one thing, then what stops God from changing his will in another thing? And what if we don't know he did? <laughs> Do you see how convoluted it can become? The gospel, the truth, is so simple if we just say the old colloquialism that I was given growing up. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Period. That leaves no wiggle room. There's no room for argument. Now, will I still not trust him? My nature can be such that I will. If I'm out of fellowship with him because of sin in my life or because I got too busy and I'm not being with him, that might be a few problems. But that's not him. That's me. So when we examine the relationship, look at our lives. Where have we made a wrong decision? Oh, let's change that. Where have we sinned? Because God won't. And he doesn't make any wrong decisions. Okay. But again, that's the wonderful news upon which we can stand and trust God continually. So she's going to her king, an earthly king, with this request. Okay, so. Then King Asherah said to King Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? The king didn't know the edict had been sent out. <laughs> okay. Now, here's, here's the interesting situation and why kings are always responsible, why leaders are always responsible for any decision that goes out from them with their name on it. Whether you signed it or not, if you gave somebody permission to send it out with your name on it, even if you didn't read it, it comes back to you. So the king didn't know this because he just signed whatever. Name and put it under. Okay, yeah. I get him off my back. Oh, that sounds good. Well, why wouldn't I do that? Of course, he didn't know his queen was Jewish. But if he doesn't like the rule, don't look at something without signing. Don't sign those papers. <laughs> don't ever sign papers. We know that, right? Who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and an enemy. This wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. I, I get, well, I'm, I, sometimes I think I have a mean sense of humor. But do, picture, don't you just, here's a banquet. And Naaman's walking in and saying, I see all of you. You know, she said, and probably there's some of them bowing to him because in the streets they did, right? He's feeling, wow, I have this feast. The king is giving me this feast. I really played Mordecai right. I am going to get what I deserve, <laughs> which he thinks is something totally different. He's thoroughly enjoying this. And Esther has beautifully set him up. The reason it was easy to do is because that pride that we just talked about is going big time before the big fall. He's walking in with arrogance written all over him. Do you see me? Do you know who I am? Mm -hmm. Some of my jocks back in the day when I was in public schools, and they were big, they walk in like into my classroom. I got down. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hey guys, you're not all that. Sit down in my classroom. But I, uh -uh, in my classroom, okay, can we do this? Yeah, we can do it. Do we do it? Yes, we do it. And girls, I would say, sadfully so and ashamedly so on my own part, yes, I've done it before my king. Don't you know who I am? What you talking about? I'm talking about, I'm God, you're not. Okay? Now, in our lives, because we know him and we've grown him, we don't do that to this extent. But there is always a danger that we will become so comfortable. Well, I got all this down. I've been a Christian forever, you know, that we forget. Sometimes I'm disobedient. You know? And we get a little arrogant. Look what all I'm doing for you. I don't count for anything, does it? How many of those things we're doing for him is going to get us to heaven? <laughs> no, not one, right? 
It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the grace. It's the forgiveness. All that that we understand. So we see this picture, which is very human. And I want you. This is the world. This is going to be the world before King Jesus. Even once they know he's King Jesus, they are going to want to say, "But no buts allowed," because there is no defense before the righteous judge. I have nothing to offer. I never did. And if I don't plead the blood of Christ at the altar, I'm really in trouble. So this is a beautiful picture of that, even though it's real human beings who lived in a real time of history, and God's name isn't mentioned. God's hand is all over it, as it is our lives. And I love learning from him that way, because it helps us just say, you, you really don't miss a trick, do you? You really, really don't miss a trick. And don't you just love it? You just love it. Okay. And so the king arose in his wrath from wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. <laughs> oh, how low has he sunk? Oh, my, this isn't good. Who am I going to see? But this first image is extremely important, too. The king left in his wrath. What if we had to stand before the king in his wrath? King Jesus would turn his back and walk away because we didn't want him. And he has a right to be filled with wrath for us ignoring the only thing he ever offered us that would save us. Okay. That's a powerful word, isn't it? The king is the one who has the wrath because one of his subjects was just deceitful. The king has the right to be with his people, doesn't he? Because we are his people. The creator of the world has the right to be angry with his creation because he created us. It's, there's no discussion. End of story. But the story gets so exciting, as you see, just how people plead their case, make their argument. Yeah, but, 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 but you know, kids always just but yeah, but mom, I got an excuse. How many of you kids ever did that? I, I had a kid once in a while, but mom, <laughs> you're already doomed, right? Because <laughs> those don't work. We're already trying to excuse ourselves because we know we're guilty. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. What do you think he could say to her? If you were him, what would you say to her? <laughs> Forgive me? Save me. Go talk to the king. Please go talk to the king. Now, there's a little problem with something missing here when he's doing that. Is repentance when you're scared to death and you know you've been caught? Is repentance when you realize you were wrong and you really want forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I told you, my, my kid, for the, about the third time in probably a week, this is a few years ago, so was sent to my office and he knew he was in trouble. And oh, did he turn on the tears. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. And I said, I heard that last week and the week before. I'm so sorry, Miss Lee. I won't ever do it again. Wipe the tears because they're fake. <laughs> You're not sorry. You got caught. You're upset. You got caught. Let's admit it and call it what it is. Because until we call it what it is, we don't change. Repentance means I know that was dreadful and I am sorry I hurt my Lord. And I want forgiveness. Because I need it. I'm not trying to pass you queen. No. I'm caught red-handed. I'm not trying to avoid consequences. I truly am sorry. We all know there's a difference, don't we? And true repentance is the only thing that causes us to walk away and leave the sin. And if we just say, oh, that's okay. I understand. We all make mistakes. Are those things all true? Mm-hmm. But if we don't give consequences, 
then do we do the same thing? Your children did the same thing until the consequence was so hard, you know, that they learned. We're the same way. People are that way. That's our nature. So, Haman was falling on the couch, or Esther was. <laughs> I like this, too. It just gets better and better. You know, the long couches they used in those days to recline on to eat. Has he been humbled? Well, yeah, he's humble. He's eating humble pie. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to change. We can be humble the next day if we think we got by it. That arrogance comes right back. <laughs> but I love it for Esther. Esther must be head of a ball. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? The king left in anger, right? He comes back. Haman has had a couple words with the queen, but when the king walks back in, what does he see him doing? <laughs> Not a pretty picture. All over that couch with the queen. It looks like, obviously, what we think it looks like. The king didn't know the beginning of the story. He didn't need to, did he? Because what he already knows is that Haman has been deceitful has abused his privileges that the king has given him. What he thought was happening is beside the point because the man has already been found guilty. But don't you just love it how a foolish person, when they're trying to defend what they have done wrong, just digs a deeper hole for themselves. Okay. And you probably get tired of my stories, but I always have stories from kids. Because kids do that, and we do that. You know, how they're trying to get themselves. <laughs> You're digging in deeper. No, I can explain. I said, it's going to be harder to get away from this. Do you ever do that? Do you ever try to get yourself out of a mess, and you decide you're in a bigger mess than you were when you started? It's usually because we don't want to tell the whole truth right up front. Okay? My mother was always a stickler for telling the truth and she always said if you don't tell the whole truth you're lying that's a lie and that was good training but one night I was struggling to finish a book I was so tired mom said well let me read the last couple pages to you which is fine I mean, there's no reason why she couldn't we were not told that we couldn't have somebody read it or read it with somebody so I went into school and the first thing the teacher asked how many of you read the entire book and, and I didn't raise my hand she said did you read it no I didn't read the entire book. My mom read part of it. I got in trouble. I went home and I told mom, why did you tell her that? Because you told me that if I didn't tell the whole truth, it <laughs> wasn't the truth. So help me God. <laughs> well, I didn't mean it like that. Okay. But we, we fall into those situations sometimes because we misunderstand, sometimes because I better co confess and all, eventually I'm going to get caught. Or, oh, you didn't read that way. We have to explain it. <laughs> so, you can see, uh, the king isn't having to guess what's going on here. He knows he's pleading. He probably isn't the least bit concerned that they're going to do anything sexual, but he has caught him where he wants him because he's so angry with him, he said. And as the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. <laughs> you, guess, you know, Shakespeare used to write what we call comedy of errors. In a tragedy, he would add some piece that was kind of funny to relieve our minds a little bit. So do you, you did chuckle. Don't you almost have to chuckle? Because the king already knows. It doesn't matter where he found him when he came back in. He's got his henchman behind him covering Haman's mouth. You're not going to talk no more. I've heard all I want to hear from you. Why? Because you're spewing lies. There's nothing more to be said. You can't defend yourself. Okay, He's already planning what Haman was worried about. Be sure your sins will find you out is the truth God has told us, right? Because what we do in secret will be shown for all the world to see, and everybody knows it. But who has known it all along? God, and that's most important of all. 
Okay, but you see how this picture is being a, a little bit comical because don't we like seeing Haman get his comeuppance? <laughs> we all do. Now the problem is we don't want to see us get our comeuppance. <laughs> okay. As heinous as what he did was, his deliberate attempt to try to wipe out all the Jews, he was trying to thwart God's plan, which he had no idea was God's plan. And in our worldly view, even with a Christian world view, and a Christian view of sin, we still can sort of see that there sort of are degrees of sin. Some things are a little more heinous than others because more people are sick. Everybody agrees agree, Hitler's sins are more heinous. The fact is, though, Hitler's sins and our sins are equal in the sight of what God had to do to cover them. Okay. Now, in the judgment, the deeds will be open. That's why that's important. Hitler will be judged. I think there are degrees of hell. I don't think maybe that there's absolute proof. But I think if you read, when the judgments are meted out, they're not meted out equally. Good moral people, if they're not believers, are going to hell. So is Hitler. How would you like that for a roommate the rest of your life? You know. Sinners saved by grace and grace alone are going to heaven for eternity because God desired it. And this is all just showing that bigger picture. And so I say we do have an attitude towards people who are so evil that we do want them to, to see them get their just reward. They will. They will. The other side of that is God says he's the only one that can judge because he's faithful and good and righteous. We can't meet out, ladies, we can't meet out fair justice because we had to have it meted out to us. Can we have courts of law? Yes. Should we have courts of law? Yes. Is it okay? I believe the scripture very definitely supports the death penalty in some cases for the good of the cause. But God had to institute those laws because we're sinners. Okay. So... Are you seeing how the, all this... I know you are because you're so good. You're such a good class. You really are good students. I'm seeing you're getting at the lights. Okay, but isn't it fun to tie all the pieces together? <laughs> well, God, you're good. You, you did, and you have all these good stories. So, <clears throat> okay. And so the king, they had to cover his face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, in attendance to the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai whose word saved the king, is standing in Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of God, or of the king, abated. Oh, we won't get through with Esther, but we've got to focus on this. The king went out in wrath. Anger over what one of his servants did. It was inexcusable. He was a trusted servant. He had a lot of power. He had the king's ear. And he betrayed the king. The king was angry. The king went out and said, I will take care of this problem. He wrapped his mouth shut. That's what got him in trouble anyway, didn't it? And in his wrath, he had determined what he would do. And he would hang the guilty party on the high gallows. And once Naaman was hung there and died, what happened? The king's wrath abated. When God hung his innocent son on the cross and he died and said it is finished the king's wrath abated how do we absorb that how do we accept that therefore there is no condemnation wrath to those who are called 
God's wrath. We have been under his wrath until we admitted we were sinners, confessed our sin, and Jesus forgave us, and we no longer suffer the wrath of God. Isn't this a picture of salvation? A king who in no way had to deal with his servant. He had every right to take his life and all the rules. The king who made us has every right in anybody's book to take our lives. When we disobey, he has every right to pour out his wrath. But because of every quality of God that we know, he spoke before the foundation of the world, I'm making a plan to redeem some of you. And I can't change that no matter what you do. He reentered that, reiterated that problem a number of times. Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin will conceive. Why does he need to do that? He kept Jesus in safe several times when he was a baby. Satan tempted him. Jesus didn't surrender. He's protected. On and on it goes, right? Because the wrath of the king said, I will be appeased when I give my son, my perfect son, to die for you. Then and only then can my wrath be appeased. And at that same moment, Jesus was hearing it. And in Gethsemane, he said, not my will. Doors be done. Now, I would apologize for the tears, but you know it wouldn't do any good. And do you know, girls... I really do want to go on my deathbed crying again about what he did for me, knowing I'm going to see him face to face and fall on my knees before him. But if Esther is anything without God's name ever being mentioned, it is a song of redemption. It is a promise that God always finishes what he started. And it is an absolute assurance that in Christ Jesus, we will not suffer his wrath. Ever. How can we not praise him? How can we not serve him? How can not we be overwhelmed by what he did for us? All because he chose to. You know? I heard a song, some of you probably heard this. Now, I heard, sometimes they don't understand what I'm hearing because they go so fast. And they're, they're, they're peppy and they're cute and you get into them. So I figured everybody else knew what these words were. All of a sudden I thought, oh, this is my song. You know, I know you know who sings it. Um, seven years old, sitting on a pew, John 3.16. Jesus called my name. And then she says, you can't take the church from you you can take me out of the church, you can't take the church out of me. That's, that was my testimony. I was set, not seven, I was six years old, sitting on the pew in the church. Just I said, I see that church. That's the same church she was in. You know, John 3, 16. Yeah, I knew that. Jesus saved me. And, and then she talks about, you know, straying from it some of the times. But what she said for certain was, you can take me out of that particular church, but what you can't take is the church, what the church messes with. You can't take John 3.16 away from me. You can't take it away from you. If it's yours, if he's yours, that's forever sealed. Isn't that a marvelous promise? But we have to live it out because the world doesn't believe it. And the world is telling the lies of Satan so that the world will be confused. And we know God is not the author of confusion. Okay, we going to have to wrap it up. Any comments, questions, or prayer requests? Thank you for joining us today in Marianne's new short series entitled, What If? If you enjoyed it, please click the like button. And Marianne will be returning to complete the Matthew Gospel in the near future. This is just a short summer series. So enjoy, be blessed, and we'll see you next week.